Welcome to the UP Notable Books Club, brought to you by the Upper Peninsula Publisher and Authors Association. Jane Kopecki is a graduate of Manistique High School. She has reading specialist degrees from Northern Michigan University. She has taught in the Unica Public School System, Minneapolis Public School System, Taquamanon Area Schools, and retired from the Manistique Area Schools. Jane is a history buff who belongs to the Michigan Historical Society, the Newton Township Historical Society, Mackinac County, and is curator of the Schoolcraft County Historical Society in Manistique. Her interest in conscientious objectors spurred her to apply for a position on the Selective Service Board. She served on that board for 20 years, the maximum time allowed. She is also the author of Hunt Spur Along the Tracks, the history of a small upper Michigan community whose past comes to life through interviews with local residents and countless historical photographs. Uh, my name, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Victor Volkman. I'm the current president of the Upper Peninsula Publishers and Authors Association. Uh, we are co-sponsors of these events with the Crystal Falls District Community Library. And this is the 14th event, which we're featuring this week, uh, Jane Kopecki, who is the author of World War II, Conscientious Objectors in Germfask, Michigan, the Alcatraz Camp. As I mentioned before, she lives in Manistique. And uh, thank you for joining us tonight, Jane. Well, thank you for inviting me. It's an honor. And I want to thank you uh, for all the work you've done for the UPPAA and Evelyn. And I see Tyler down there. I also want to thank Tyler. He uh, <laughs> edited both of my books. He was uh, quite tolerant <laughs> and uh, really, really did a, a, a bang up job for me. I don't know if I could have pulled it off without him because I was so emotionally involved in the book. It was hard for me to, to get it organized. But um, before I begin, I'd like to know, was, has anyone here, had anyone here heard about World War II conscientious objectors before they read this book? Was anybody aware of it? Yes, Deborah. I was a little bit aware of it. Um, I can't remember what movie it was. We saw um, a while back, but it had to do with conscientious objectors. Yeah, it was Hex, Hex, Hexaw Ridge, I think. Was that? Yeah, yeah, that was right. it. Um, but that was all I knew about it. Yeah. My dad took us for a ride to... Um, around the Upper Peninsula when I was young and still in high school. And we happened to go through Germ Fest and he, he was the one that was telling me about it. So I've known about it for quite a while, but it was just, you know, nice to read the book and find a little more about it. Okay. Um, well, I had never, yes. But I have an uncle that, um, that was a conscientious objector, but he went in as a medic. Yes. Uh, and he was then um, captured and uh, treated quite badly by the Germans because he was of German extract he, and uh, he could speak German. And so he had a rough time of it over there in France, actually, one of the, so I did know about them, but I, I loved your book. It was so good. Thank you. Um, did anybody, oh, um, well, for me, I, I had never heard about conscientious objectors in my history or political science classes. I don't think it's a topic that wasn't really discussed. Um, and um, so when I started my research, um, I just couldn't stop. I wanted to find out more and more. Um, I grew up in a small farm, 12 miles from Germfast. It's in Schoolcraft County, Mueller Township. And I attended what we, the Green School. It's called the Green School because on the corner of Old US 2, there was a big building and it was green. And so the place became known as the Green School. And I attended kindergarten through eighth grade there. Today, most people don't know the name of the green school, they call it Mueller Township. Like everything else, things fade away. But uh, had I not been born and lived in this community, 
And had I not been there at that particular place and time, I would have never discovered this history. Um, if I would have been a little bit earlier, many of the people would have refused to talk to me about it. It was a very emotional issue. And some of the COs um, uh, didn't want to discuss it. But after a while, you know, 30 years, uh, they started to open up to me, a stranger. If I would have waited a little bit longer, most of them have been would have been uh, passed away. So it was just um, uh, the luck of the draw. But the the, um, the thing that got me interested was that I was taking this, uh, finishing up my master's degree at Northern, and I just had a few credits left and the professor, my advisor asked me what I liked and I said local history. So he gave me an oral history project to work on. He said, just choose anything that you would like. So I, uh, I remembered an incident and this is in the book, but it was so important to me. Um, I was very young. My sister and I were playing on the front steps of our farmhouse. We had a small 80 acre farm, like most people around us did in those days. And uh, <clears throat> my mother came out and she said, come into the house right away, come in. And so we went into the house and she looked out the window and there were three strangers approaching the house and they emerged from a small wooded area and this was very unusual because we did not have strangers walking around the neighborhood. Um, my, uh, we had no locks on our doors. My mother was worried. Um, and so uh, she was very, ups she was really nervous and she, I could sense her nervousness and I started crying. So she put some chairs up to the kitchen window so we could see what was going on. And these three men walked up to this rock pile not too far from the front door of our house. And they had a gunny sack and they would put the one rock in or they would pass it around and look at it and then they'd put it into the gunny sack or toss it back on the pile of uh, stones. And uh, so the fear left us because we we're kind of intrigued as to what they would be doing. And eventually um, a car came down the road and my mother ran out and flagged it down. And a man got out and went over to these three men and in a gruff voice, he told them something. And so they picked up the gunny sack and they left. And then um, that evening when my dad came home, my mom told him about it. And uh, he was really upset, very upset about it. Draft dodgers and all kinds of nasty things. So anyway, um, I decided this, this, memory came back to me. So when I was doing my oral history project, I decided that I wanted to find out about these men. Over the years, I'd heard very little, except once in a while, there'd be a snide remark, or there's always a mention of draft dodgers and a few other uh, adjectives that um, I won't say here. So anyway, I started interviewing people and I said, um, I'd like to know about the conscientious objectors that were here. And they would say, conscientious objectors? Oh, you mean the conchies? Those men, we all call them conchies. Well, during World War II, conscientious objector was not a term was uh, used often. That didn't come about until the Vietnam era. So anyway, I started asking people and... Uh, one of them said they were cowards. They said they didn't believe in killing, but do you think anybody that believed that was in the war liked killing? And then um, another said, they thought they were better than us. And another said, some of them were communist. And then another one said, uh, something to do with the Mennonite church, Reverend Osborne's brought them here. But then when, when I, uh, I would ask them, well, did you ever talk to them? No. Uh, what do you know about them? Well, nothing, just what I heard. Uh, one lady said uh, they were supposed to work at the senior refuge, but they refused to work. But my girlfriend's father was a, a 
supervisor there and he, they got him to he got these men to work and i said well how to do it he said he'd shoot them if they didn't and i i was like what do you mean he was going to shoot them how could they get away with that and she said oh nobody would have cared <laughs> So anyway, my curiosity was perked. Now I wanted to know how these presumed men from rich families were sent to germ fast uh, hit, to hide in these because they were so far removed that no one could find them. So um, I went to Bruce Handridge, the Mennonite minister in germ fast because someone said, oh, Bruce was in that camp. Well, Bruce was a conscientious objector during World War II, but he was not in the germ fast camp. And he gave me a lot of information. He explained how the, the conscientious objectors uh, of World War II came about. And he gave me a book. It was the Mennonite Directory of Conscientious Objectors. And this book listed all the men that were World War II conscientious objectors. It gave their, they were listed in alphabetical order and it would tell their birth date, where they were, where they enlisted. And then it would tell their religious affiliation and it would list the camps they were in. So um, I had started to go to the library and I was doing some research. Uh, there was nothing I could find at university libraries about the conscientious objectors at Jerome Fask. Uh, there were books, a few books out at that time in 1979 um, that started, that explained some of it from the religious point of view. But it wasn't until later that I found out that Jerome Fask was a special camp, the only camp of its kind in the United States that held approximately these 100 men that were objecting to war and they were sent there so the government could analyze them. Also, it was close to the Newberry State Hospital and they kept sending the men over to the hospital to get uh, analyzed and then they'd send them back to the camp, but they never kept any, any of them there. So, um, so another thing that I did, I, I was still going around to all these different neighbors and I uh, went to this one lady's home, uh, there was a news paper article in the Manistee Pioneer Tribune about one of the conscientious objectors that had been arrested for falsifying a hunting license. And she had to testify at, the, uh, at his trial. And so I went to her house and uh, her husband had, was deceased at that time. And I asked her if she knew about this. And she said, yes. And I said, uh, she said, I have some newspaper articles that I've kept about them. So I said, uh, could I see them? She said, well, they're under my bed. So I said, would you mind if I, if I saw them? She said, well, I can't get on, down to get under my bed. So I crawled under her bed and she had the original newspaper articles from the Escanaba Daily Press that I used in the book. Those are where most of the pictures came from. And then also uh, she had the pictures uh, from the Detroit Free Press and several other papers, uh, the front page uh, papers, uh, pages that, show, that uh, talked about the, uh, uh, what was it? The um, camp intellectuals uh, revolt, uh, germ fast follies. Uh, there were just, uh, all kinds of things. And one of them they called uh, the germ fast, the Alcatraz of all the CPS camps. So anyway, uh, that's how I began getting my research. Um, I went through that book that Bruce Hendridge gave me and I started looking, um, I guess I'll go back. I'll, give you a little bit of background information. It's in the book, but just to clarify how this all came about. Um, prior to World War II, the, um, the, uh, our Congress was debating uh, the Selective Service Act. 
Uh, there was isolationism and intervention, and they knew that eventually there would be a war coming. And meanwhile, the three peace churches, that's the Brethren, the Mennonites, and the Quakers, they're known as the historic peace churches. And they have always um, actively uh, involved their men in nonviolence and in um, non-participation in war. And during World War I, these men were forced into the uh, armed forces where they were treated horrendously. Those that didn't go in were sent to prison. Some of them died there um, with the cruel treatment that they were given. And so these peace churches lobbied Congress. So the first time in the history of America, men were allowed an exemption from the selective service. And it was the first time that a draft law had been enacted prior to war. Other times, uh, men were drafted after a war would break out. So anyway, in this, um, this agreement with the government, uh, the religious objectors were allowed exemption in lieu of Nash doing work of national importance. But nobody knew what the work of national importance was at that time. Nobody had figured out how they were going to do it. And neither the president nor Congress were in a mood to help them in any way. But it was at that time that uh, we had um, the CCC's uh, Civilian Conservation Corps uh, that was established to um, remove, to, to give men meaningful employment. And these were very highly respected uh, work, highly respected work um, that they did. And they were uh, camps spread throughout the country. Well, now we have the wartime economy. So these, these, uh, institutions, these government agencies that had men doing work uh, now were in need of men. So the COs uh, were to move into these CCC camps and take over that work. In order to go into those camps, they, every man had to pay the government $35 a month. That was a lot of money. Um, they had to sign a document that and release the government from any injuries that they might receive doing that work. Uh, in addition, they had to supply their own food, their own clothing. Uh, they were only given medical treatment if they were injured on the job, but if they were if there were if they were killed, their body would be sent home. But if there was serious injury, they were kept in the hospital until they were well enough to go home. There was no compensation to the families or the men, and so this became a, a boiling point for some of the uh, COs that were there. Well, throughout um, the. Uh, the men started going into the camps and there were 151 CPS, it was called civilian public service camps located throughout the United States. Germfast was camp 135. Um, so things moved along quite, quite well for a while. And then uh, some of the men that were objected to the war and conscription and paying the $35 a month Starting to started to put up a fuss, and um, they the camps were also became a holding tank for those few men that got into the system, and the, nobody knew what to do with them legally, so they left them in the system. So these are some of the men that ended up in germ fast. Um, the Let's see. There were the first camp that the Selective Service started was in Mancos, uh, Colorado. They tried to remove these troublemakers into one camp. And uh, in this camp, uh, the $35 a month fee was eliminated. Um, and the government would uh, supply their basic needs. Well, this group of men continued um, to, they were in mostly intellectuals. They continued their protest 
and they were uh, having an influence on the other CPS men. So the government then confined these men again and they sent them to a camp in Lapine, Oregon. And uh, this is where Vincent Beck, I went through the, um, uh, anyway, that the men went from Lapine, Oregon to Germ Basque. So anyway, how, do you, how did I find these men? It was 1979 when I began, there were no computers. Um, but I did have the book that Bruce Handridge gave me. So I would, um, I went through and I looked for Camp 135. And when I found that, that number, I would write the guy's name down and then his uh, place origin and birth date. And um, so when I came to, and then I would try to call, I would get on the phone. And in those days, uh, you could get information, you dial an area code, for example, 906-555-1212, and you could ask any, you would ask the operator, for example, would you give me Jane Kopecky's phone number, and do you have her address, and so, you know, you could get information easily. So now it's um, almost 40 years after these men have left germ bask, and I want to find out if I could find any of them alive. And uh, anyway, I came to the bees and there was uh, Beck, Vincent Beck. And he was in 135. So, and he was in, uh, at a town in, in uh, Ohio, Archibald, Ohio. So I thought, well, if he lived there, he was a Mennonite. And so I called Archibald, Ohio and I asked for Vincent Beck and the operator gave me his name or his number. And I called it. And um, when I, I told him, you know, who I was and what I was doing, and uh, we started conversations, his letters, some of his letters are in the book. And uh, he gives a good explanation of uh, what happened. But he said, I wasn't in germ fast. That was an error in the book. But I did know most of the men were there. And he said, um, in Lapine, uh, it was mostly a Mennonite camp until the, uh, the Selective Service decided to turn it over to a Selective Service camp. And he says, as the, uh, these so-called uh, conscientious objectors came in, then the Mennonites would be moved out. And he said, uh, there was a young man there. His name was Danny Dingman. And uh, he was anti-conscription anti-war, anti-killing, and he was extremely determined um, that he would not participate in the system. And his way of protesting was uh, to do, pretend that he didn't know anything. And so um, one day out on the work project, uh, the uh, he was told to trim a tree so that the uh, sawyers could come in and, and uh, cut the tree down. And uh, he was given, you know, given instruction and so, okay, cut this off, what is this? And the foreman would say, this is an ax. So then he said, what do you do with it? So the foreman demonstrated what to do. And uh, then he left and when he came back, Danny Dingman was at the top of the tree and there weren't any branches on the tree. Uh, he had cut them all off, and then he said, uh, the work foreman said, get down, and he said, I can't, I don't know how, I'm a slave. So anyway, um, this uh, Vincent Beck gave me, um, in all of his letters, he, would, he uh, sent me, uh, he played in a band, and so the uh, COs made up songs, and so he sent me a tape recording of all the songs that they would sing. And what happened at, at a table, there would be the camp administration would sit in the front. And then he said the, the Mennonites were at one table and all the other uh, bad boys sat at another table. And so when they found out, uh, that, uh, anyway, when Danny, um, there was a list posted uh, one day, and it was all of the bad boys from that camp would be sent to a camp in Germfast. And um, so Danny um, said the men sang this song. Now, 
Vin, I couldn't get Vincent to record it and I wanted a group of, of men to sing it energetically, but I couldn't. So what I have here is, boy, well, <laughs> don't that I, I got my husband to sing the song. So anyway, I want you to just hear this. And in the back of the book, you'll see some uh, songs that, okay. M-I-C-H-I-G. We all know this will be the end. One way passage to germ fast. The cold storage spot for the bad boy class. We don't believe that slavery is right. We fight it in our own way with might. So off to Michigan are we and not work to liberty. So anyway, that I hope could you hear it? <laughs> Okay. He had a great voice. <laughs> he did good for me. But anyway, so um, as you know from reading the book, when the uh, uh, COs were sent to, the bad boys were sent to Germ Fast, um, the Sini Wildlife Refugee and the staff there were not prepared. Uh, they didn't find out until the night before these first men arrived that uh, this was a camp where their main job was to uh, spy on these men, find out anything they could to send them. And um, so the first day, uh, things started happening pretty fast. Uh, Corbett Bishop, the most, uh, he was the man that, that was noted in all the CPS camps. Uh, and he had... Uh, uh, people would usually give a little smile when they said his name. There were all kinds of rumors about him, but it, he was kind of the hero of the CPS camps. Uh, he was there. He had a 25, I think a 25 day fast at germ fast all together in different CPS camps. I think he fasted like 470 days or something throughout the war. Um, there was um uh, there was a Japanese American uh, there, um, and he was, uh, he had applied for a CO status, and then when the war broke out, the government wanted to put him in a Japanese internment plant in uh, camp, and then all the uh, CPS men uh, wrote letters, and eventually he was sent to germ fast. And from there, he walked out of germ fast with another um, conscientious objector, and they were picked up and sent to federal prison. Um, there was uh, one man that I met later. His name is Arden Bodie. So Arden um, was a, a really, uh, not sure, I think he was a Presbyterian faith. But anyway, he... Um, he walked out of out of uh, germ fast knowing that he would be imprisoned, and uh, he was sent to uh, Ashland Prison, and there he was a cellmate of uh, Barnard Rustin. If any of you know who he is, he was the mentor to Robert uh, to uh, Martin Luther King. He was Martin Luther King's mentor. I don't know if any of you know of him. He's quite famous. Um, he was a gay uh, black man and uh, he helped uh, Martin Luther King set up his marches. And I said, as I said, he was the mentor. So he was um, Arden, one of Arden Bowden's uh, prison mates. Now Arden Bodie, there were, uh, the prisons were segregated at that time. And uh, Arden was uh, first put in with the white population, and then they moved him into the black population, which was really an insult. And Arden said um, that was okay, he liked it there a lot better because he got to listen to good jazz instead of hillbilly music. And I met Arden um, years later in Tampa when I finally got to meet Danny Dingman. Uh, and he was still protesting. He protested during the Vietnam War, and uh, he was still in active in peace in peace movements. Another one uh, that was there was um, 
Richard Lazarus. His mother um, was a strong anti-war activist from New York. And she and her husband accompanied Albert Einstein as delegates to the World uh, Disarmament Conference in Geneva in um, 1933. Um, and Richard Lazarus' uh, memoir is in my book, his family. I keep contact with his family yet. His mom has passed away, but um, with his, I keep, uh, his one sister I keep in contact with. Uh, there was a, Don DeVault was a scientist. Um, he made national headlines. Uh, he was trying to do biochemical research and he, he asked if he could do it anywhere um, and with no pay, just if they would supply the materials, but the government refused to do that. They told him if he wanted to be a guinea pig um, in some experiment later on that they would allow him to do that. And so I think uh, in one of the Chicago papers, there was uh, an article written uh, about him. Uh, um, Al Partridge, I met Al Partridge's wife um, after uh, years later. Uh, Al Partridge was a uh, language speech professor and um, he walked out of prison, out of germ fast, knowing he would be imprisoned. And uh, he also went to Ashland Prison, where he was uh, protesting the segregation of the black and the white, uh, the black and white. And so he, um, as a result, he was placed in uh, solitary confinement for a long period of time. Uh, his wife uh, was also sent to prison, although she was not part of his conspiracy for, you know, of what he was doing. And they had a child uh, that was sent to an orphanage. Um, and I met um, Mrs., the second Mrs. Partridge in 2006 and her, one of her son and not the one that was orphaned, but anyway, so I keep track of them. But uh, he went on to um, California where they started the first public radio uh, and they called it Pacifica, not because it was on the Pacific Ocean, but Pacifica was kind of a password for these um, uh, World War II COs. There was a, a, a safe house in California and they called it Pacifica. Um, but anyway, um, I finally got to meet Dan Dingman. I, as I said, I started my research in, you know, 1979. And then with the age of the computer, I finally found Danny Dingman. To me, he was like the, uh, the main character in the book. And, uh, that was extremely interesting to me. Um. I went out on the computer and this was in like, I, I'm not sure of the year, but anyway, I, I uh, looked up Dan Dingman and there were about five of them. And um, so I found this one number in Florida. And when I called, um, I said, my name is Jane Kopecki and I'm doing some research. And I, are you the Danny Dingman that was in Germfast during World War II? And he said, yes, I was. <laughs> And so we talked for quite a while and, and uh, uh, I said, oh, I would love to meet you. He said, well, you know, come and visit me. So I had contacted Mark Rosenbaum from NPR radio and um, he was interested in the story. So we flew down there together and met uh, Danny Dingman and his family, Arden Bodie and another uh, germ fast um, CEO, Nick Malegliario, and then Arden Bodie, as I said, Arden Bodie flew in. And uh, uh, it was a wonderful experience. Uh, it was very eye-opening to me. Uh, Danny Dingman um, was still, he was uh, very successful in life, but he lived a very modest life uh, physically, materialistically. Uh, he went uh, to the uh, University of Florida 
to the veterans associate veterans uh, group there, explained what he's, his feelings were. And from that, uh, Veterans for Peace was started. He uh, refused government contracts because they were related to the armed forces. Um, he was just a, a true humanitarian. Uh, uh, so anyway, this was uh, an education for me. I'd gone into a world uh, that I hadn't ever expected to go into. Um, I read uh, All Quiet on the Western Front because many of the men said they had read that book and it had a profound influence on them. Um, Corbett Bishop was a follower of Mahatma Gandhi, so I started studying about uh, passive resistance and, and Gandhi. Um, uh, and then I became extremely interested in the selective service. So I think, how are these, how does the government view selective, uh, these conscientious objectors? So Anyway, I was on the, the uh, Selective Service Board uh, for 20 years, and uh, that was quite an experience. Um, I, that when I, we had to go to training, and that was in Detroit. It was uh, initial training for members. And uh, when I went there, I asked some of the instructors if they knew about World War II conscientious objectors, and none of them had ever heard about it. <laughs> but uh, the, um, there are still active selective service boards today. Most people don't know that. Uh, when I was on it, after Vietnam, the Vietnam War, the uh, selective service boards or draft boards were disbanded, and then a short time later, they were reactivated again. But there are boards out there throughout the country uh, ready in case of an emergency, in case men are called up. Um, to hear, uh, you know, to, to judge some of these men. Uh, it, was, uh, it was interesting because um, we would have mock trials would be presented to us and we had to decide uh, if we felt they were truly a conscientious objector or not. Uh, so anyway, that's, uh, that was interesting. So I have some more things to say, but, uh, and I could skip around some more, but are there any questions? Did you, uh, were you able to um, speak to any of the people in GermFast that didn't like having them around and in GermFast? Oh, absolutely. They despised them. Um, some of this is in the book, so I didn't know if I should get into it. Reverend Osborne, uh, the people blamed Reverend Osborne for bringing the people to germ fast, these men. He wasn't. He was just the, um, he was just to be their, their religious advisor. And uh, there was an incident where um, there was a, a box had arrived and in it, was some things and on it was marked uh, storm flag. And he said, oh, I don't storm. He didn't know what a storm flag was. And so they, um, he just set it aside. Well, there was an elderly man at the camp that heard him say that they didn't need the flag. It was actually an American flag. And so from that rumor spread that the Mennonites did not believe in saluting the flag. Then the, uh, the people in the town, uh, the membership in the church stopped. The people in the town uh, threatened to tar and feather him. And he was forced to leave town. And um, so anyway, I had contacted Reverend Osborne uh, prior to the computer age. And he told, one of the things he told me was, I'd always been thinking about writing, you know, the, what happened there. And he said, this is the inspiration that I need for it. So he gave me, he wrote volumes, uh, pages and pages. And I sorted through and I put some in the book. Uh, Bruce Hendridge, who came to GermFast uh, after the war, people 
would snub him. If they saw him walking down the street, they would go to the other side of the street. And his wife said one of the hardest things she ever did was send her child to kindergarten. She didn't want him to go to school. It was just frightening for her. Um, there was also um, uh, an incident of a lynching. And Reverend Osborne told me that one night, um, this Dave Miller, a CO, came to his house late at night. And he was worried. Uh, there, He had received word that there was going to be trouble. He was married and his wife and small child, child were uh, working there. She was working as a maid in one of the local homes there. And uh, the people were upset that she was there. They despised these men. And so uh, they were going to do something to his wife to lure him to that site so they could lynch him. And Bruce told me that had the circumstances been, he thought it had to do with um, um, a group of men on a hot summer night in the bar drinking, but it didn't come about. Um, but anyway, I went, when I was doing these interviews, I went to a man, I'm not gonna say his name, he's deceased now, but I don't wanna say his name. And uh, he was an acquaintance of my dad's. My dad would have coffee with him. And in a small area like that, of course, everybody knows everybody. And I thought, well, he, he, may, he didn't participate in the war. He might have been just a little bit too old or there might have been a you know, flat feet or whatever you know, would keep him out of the war. So I went to visit him and I, I told him what I was doing and he walked up to me really close. He closed his arms across his chest. He got close enough that his belt buckle touched me. He got into my space and he had this look in his eye and he said, I don't know anything about it. And I go, and he turned around and he walked away. And I thought, oh my goodness, <laughs> now I know who might have been involved. So then um, maybe a year or so later, I, I was with my dad and he was there and it's like that incident never happened. Mm -hmm. um, the, uh, another incident that occurred was a lynching, an attempted lynching in Newberry. And this would have been Al Partridge was a focus of that. Um, and this is described in detail in the book. Um, and I actually have three different uh, letters concerning that incident. And I just put the one in that I thought explained it the most. But uh, the, um, the men were taken into town periodically for recreation. They came in the back of this truck. And it was on a Sunday afternoon, I believe. And uh, they went into a bar, of course, to, um, uh, to have a drink waiting for the movie to start. And then there was a group of men that started to attack them. They kicked them. Uh, they got them outside into the back of the truck. Uh, and they were, by then, I believe there were like 150 people. And they were, they, you know, let's pull out his beard. Uh, Anyway, uh, they managed to escape and they got back to Germfast. And Al Partridge said, uh, Al Partridge's wife said it was the first time Al was ever happy to get back to camp. Um, but he was the focus of their, um, of their anger along with several of the other men. But then the police, uh, they, were, they, they reported it to the police and the police, uh, state police came and said, well, you got away this time, but if, if it happens again, don't expect us to get you out of trouble. So uh, the anger from this carried on for many years. Mr. Weaver, who was uh, the Green School Mennonite minister, um, someone threw a skunk in his trunk, the trunk of his car at one time. As late as the... Uh, 1950s, the late 1950s, 
the Mennonite church, our local Green School Mennonite church was broken into. It was vandalized. Books were strewn about. Graffiti was written on the walls. And uh, my mom went down to help clean it up. And I said, well, why don't they report it to the police? And she said, well, it's not the Mennonite way. The Germfast Church was also broken into during the war, and that was vandalized. Uh, uh, also, uh, one of the schools, the uh, I'm not sure, it was the Green School hired a, a Mennonite uh, teacher. And this is in 1964, and uh, he was let go because he was... Uh, he was, uh, didn't believe in saluting the flag, so they said. So these, these memories and the hatred, the anger was really strong. And, you know, you can't blame the people. It was World War II. I mean, our country had pulled together. Uh, you know, we made many sacrifices. And who are these group of men to think that they don't have to work, they don't have to fight? So uh, uh, one of the CEOs that was not at Germfask, uh, Van Dyke wrote a book in night, it was published in 2000, and he called Germfast the, uh, the bubbling cauldron. And he said he hoped the, the history of it would be written. And I wanted to find the history of it. So I, I said, I wish I could be a fly on the wall to find out what these men were thinking. What were they, you know, what would, what, what were their philosophies? And Arden Bodie told me, he said, Jane, you wouldn't have wanted to been there. To have been there, it wasn't fun. It was extreme. It was, it was horrible. The things, you know, the anxiety that we went through. Um, but I, I did. I believe through the letters the interviews, the documents that are in the book, the memoirs, the songs. I believe that the reader can actually feel as though they've moved into that camp, that they can uh, understand the philosophy of these men and why they did what they did. Um, one of the things that was, that was most surprising to me is when I was going through the book, on finding the uh, COs and I dialed the area code and this was early on, this was in uh, 1980. Um, there was uh, Robert Cordell and he had been a student at the University of Chicago. So I called the University of Chicago alumni office and um, I asked if they could get me in touch with uh, Dr. Cordell, and they said, they didn't have his phone number, but he has, they had uh, his address. He was in Texas. So I called uh, area code Texas, 555-1212, and um, a man answered the phone, and uh, I got his uh, number, and a man answered the phone, and I said, my name is Jane Popecki, and I'm from Jim Basque, and I'm doing historical research on a camp that was there during World War II, and there was a complete silence. And I thought, oh. Anyway, I, I, I realized I had shocked him. Uh, he said, oh yes, he said, I was there. We called it the Siberian Concentration Camp. And uh, Anyway, uh, he said, I was working on my uh, PhD in geology at the time. And he said that I was drafted. He said, so I just continued my work there. So I told him about the incident in our barnyard. And he said, well, that was me. I was one of those men. He said, I carried those rocks with me for years. He said, I just disposed of them not too long ago. So here it is, after all these years, I find the man that was actually in our barnyard that had prompted me to continue this work. Uh, and we, uh, he's, the, his letters, some of his letters are in the book. It's a really good uh, explanation of the men that were there. Uh, and we 
uh, carried on uh, letter writing for a while and he had invited me to come and visit he and his wife in, in Texas. But um, I was working on my master's degree. I was teaching, our kids were in school, finances weren't the, you know, were a bit tight. So I didn't get a chance to go. But anyway, um, we stopped corresponding. And then uh, several years later, my husband and I came home from, uh, came home and we had an answering machine in those days. And it, uh, there was a message that uh, he said, my name is uh, so-and-so. He said, I'm Robert Cordell's son. And would you please call me? So I called him and he said, I wanted you to know that my father passed away. And in the top drawer of his desk was a letter written to you. I wanted to know if you had received it. And I said, yes, it was a copy of one of the letters that he had sent me. He said, our family was really surprised. He said, we didn't know that my dad was a conscientious objector. We had no idea. They knew nothing about it. And that letter to me that's in the book explains a lot. Uh, Dr. Cordell was um, a guinea pig in one of the uh, uh, salk uh, polio vaccine uh, at the University of Michigan. Uh, but anyway, um, uh, like I say, I said in the beginning, if I hadn't been the right time and in the right place, I wouldn't have been able to get this information. Uh, when, because some of the men, the emotions were so strong, they didn't want to talk about it. Some did. Uh, when I called Arden Bodie in California, his first comment to me was, I knew it. I knew someday somebody would care. He had never oh, wow. had anybody ask him about it. So... Anyway, uh, there are a couple other things uh, that I wanted to tell you. Um, Bruce Henrich, and this concerns selective service. Uh, Bruce Henrich and his brother both were in the uh, firefighter jump, fire jumpers uh, camps, and that uh, action. And Bruce was injured, although he never said that. I did know it. He was injured quite sever severely. But his son, uh, Rick, was a conscientious objector during, well, during the Vietnam era. And he went to the Fitzsimmon Army Hospital in uh, Colorado. And he participated in a medical research program that involved uh, every day drinking the amount of sugar that was in 20 quarts of milk. He and several others lost their vision and the experiment was stopped. He regained his vision after a few months. Um, and and they, the men were then sent to a, um, the main hospital to determine if there was permanent damage done, but of course there wasn't. And I remembered hearing something about uh, Bruce Henridge and his wife being upset that their son was in some experiment where he went blind for a while. Uh, and the other thing that I would say is that these germ fast men, this 100 men, and there were a core group of about 30, remind me of the Chicago Seven. Yes. The Chicago yes. Seven. Uh, there was, uh, in fact, one of the Chicago Seven, Dave Dillinger, was actually a World War II conscientious objector. He was the oldest one. And he, uh, rather than to go to, um, uh, into the service, he, he was in prison. Mm -hmm. And he was, um, he was a Yale, uh, he was from a wealthy family, a graduate of Yale. He was in the seminary. And uh, during the Great Depression, uh, he, he uh, lived with hobos, uh, to experience, you know, the non-materialistic type. But um, anyway, the Chicago Seven, you remember Abby Hoffman, Jerry Rubin, uh, of course, uh, Bobby Seal, all those. Yeah, I've skipped around a bit tonight, uh, but anyway, I... 
Any questions, comments? Yes, Tyler. Um, I, I would just like to know a little bit about what kind of a reception the book has received since it's been out. Oh, it's been phenomenal. Um, the um, Detroit Free Press picked it up on the front page for two days uh, in July of 2020. Uh, it's been on Amazon. Um, it's been picked up by um, the Tequaman and Fall State Park, Big Springs. It's in uh, many of the bookstores around. And uh, Amazon's been pretty good sales. It's still, it's still going. Have you had anybody say, that, oh, you shouldn't have told this story? Or is there any sense of shame around the subject still? Or are people embracing it now? Well, one of the reasons, I had a difficult time when I first started doing the research. I was so enthusiastic. And when I started to tell people about it, there was sometimes instant anger. And there still is. One of um, the book clubs I, I belonged to at one time, uh, I started telling them about it. And right away, the emotion, it's an emotional book. When you read it, you may understand how these men uh, turned out the way they did, or you may be very angry. It's still that, that uh, you know, pro-war, anti-war. And the emotions can get quite strong. You mentioned um, the POW camps, the yes. German POW camps up here. That's something I'd never heard of. Um, any chance you'll do a book about something like that? Well, I won't. Uh, <laughs> uh, John Smolton. John Smolton actually wrote. Actually wrote Wolf Mao. Did you read that? No, I haven't. Oh, it's 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 historical fiction, but it's about the awe train prisoner of war camp. Would okay. you say? Would you give that name again, please? Yeah, uh, it's Wolf. Is it Wolf Mouth? It's John Smolton. I think he's and uh, it's just oh, it's a phenomenal book, and it actually in that book there's one uh, part they talk about the germ fast conscientious objectors coming over to play soccer against the um, the German prisoner of wars but the German prisoner of war were more were uh, were better accepted by the community than the germ fast conscientious objectors oh i just i just like to say uh, jane that i admire your uh, tenaciousness and getting all that information and putting it together because I felt like even even though you said it's very emotional it's a very important topic that people don't know anything about it I'm glad that you took the time to bring that out so thank you well thank you for saying that yes I feel that too I I couldn't let it go I knew that I had to get it uh written I'm getting old <laughs> and uh so I had to get it down because I was the only one that had all the information. And I have volumes of letters and documents that I'll give to a university at some point. I believe they should be part of the public domain. Hi there. You're not gonna see my face come up. <laughs> um, I'm glad, I don't know who it was, but they brought up the fact about the wolf's mouth or they brought up the fact about a, a, the German POW camps. Now, there is a Camp Germfast listed in, if you look up uh, POWs of World War II, the camps, Germfast camp is listed. So is that the same one then as your conscientious objectors? That must be an error. There was not a POW camp in Germfast. There was a civilian pop, uh, conservation court camp first. And then when the, uh, the CCC men moved out, the conscientious objectors moved in. Uh, but there wasn't a prisoner of war camp in Germfast. Our train was one. Um, right. If, yeah. But uh, if you go through Germfast today, you're going to see a big sign, and this picture's in the back in my book. Uh, it says Civilian Conservation Corps. There's no. This is you know the camp was there, 
and it uh, was, uh, what was it, until 1945, 1946. There's no mention of the conscientious objectors camp whatsoever. Mm -hmm. oh. if, I, if you don't mind my mentioning, there was also a documentary made about the, uh, the prisoner of war camps in the UP, and I think it was made by the local public television station, maybe like 20 years ago now. And You're absolutely right. I don't, know how, I don't right. know how you can get that, but it is out there somewhere. They it's do have prisoners in our right. midst. Yeah, because I did request that. <laughs> yeah, it was done. Um, I think that John Pepin was in, uh, involved in that. And some woman from, I don't know if it was Channel 6 at the time. But yes, it was like a docudrama. And that was very interesting also. So yep, the UP has the UP has some history here, some special history. Well, I just have a question. I was surprised to hear about selective service. It's kind of taken taking away from the book for a minute. Um, do people still do boys to, or does everybody, women too, have to um, register when they turn eighteen? Men do. Men still okay. have to register. Okay. I because I, since the Vietnam War, I haven't really thought about it. You know who needs to register. So. Yeah. Um, when I, when I aged out of that system, that was one of the happier days of my life. <laughs> really. Yeah. All right, Jane, uh, thank you for coming on with us. You've been real generous with your time and uh, it's a really emotional and moving presentation and uh, we all really enjoyed it. Well, thank you. And if any of you want to contact me on the back of my book there, you can reach, I've got my email or any questions. I'm always happy to give information. Oh, and I really like the fact that you told where the name germ fast came from. We go through there all the time. That was rather interesting that it came from the dump to germ fast. <laughs> mm -hmm. An unusual name. <laughs> yes. <laughs> All right. We'll be back next month with uh, Marika Biagio and her book, Eden Waits, which is also uh, takes place around that same area of the UP. It's a novel based on the true story of Michigan's utopia community called the Hiawatha Colony. That's just a fascinating piece of historical fiction. Mm -hmm. And I hope you'll all be with us again next month. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank You're you. welcome. Goodbye now. You've been watching the UP Notable Books Club, brought to you by the Upper Peninsula Publisher and Authors Association. To join or for more information, please visit us at www.upa.org or www.upnotable.com.